Live for God Studio Productions. I guess he leads our prayer team to come up and to, yeah, and, and to lead us in a word of uh, prayer, remembering, of course, Brother Dan as he travels with his family uh, and uh, visiting his, his mom. I think Brother Dan uh, is down in Houston, isn't he? I'm not sure. Dan sure. Gonzalez is, is down in Houston, I believe, right? Yes. So some of those prayer requests. Any other prayer requests while we're... Everybody's healed. Everybody's good. Okay. They don't need any prayers. All right. Father, we just give you thanks for the day. We thank you for Dan and the love that he has for his family. Uh, thank you, God, for uh, Pastor Brandon and where he's going to be led with, by your Holy Spirit. And I ask favor upon everyone here today that they actually uh, understand whose they are. They understand the uh, gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father for that wonderful gift, that salvation, and we have the grace and mercy that you show us each and every day. And God, just uh, continue to build this church up. It is amazing, the people that you have here. So, Father, we just uh, today hang on every word that's in your Bible, every promise that's in your Bible. And thank you, God, for people that come before you and worship you as you would have them worship you. It's in Jesus' precious name. Amen. See you later, brother. Thank you, Wayne. Well, I'd like, first of all, to thank Brother Dan Hurst for the trust that he's placed in me and uh, allowing me the privilege, once again, to stand in for him uh, while he's away visiting family, especially his beloved mother. I would also like to take a minute. I know this may sound redundant, but I don't think we say it enough. I want to thank the behind-the-scenes staff that uh, runs around this room here before the class begins. Uh, our, our class president, Brother Don Martineau, his son Tim, a lot of things go on, and I hardly see them uh, until I get an opportunity to teach, and I come in early and I see all that's going on. I just stay back and watch it happen. Uh, all of those that uh, uh, take care of all of the moving parts here in-house, and then those that do everything for us as we live stream on the social media. Since our church has entered into this time of transition, the open class is realizing a most important role during this process. I believe that our teaching team, and you all know who they are, Brother Don Martineau, Brother Lewis, Hurt, uh, myself, and of course our lead teacher, Dan, I believe that our uh, teaching team, uh, I can say without the fear of contradiction, I think we all believe that Dan believes in his heart of hearts that as class leader and we as a class are on a divine appointment, one of those Dan Hurstisms that we hear a lot, divine appointment for such a time as this. I really believe that Dan believes that. Uh, as long as I've been coming to this class, I've been hearing him use these terms, these phrases, and I believe that he really believes it. So recognizing the many facets of this transition process, Dan has embarked on a teaching agenda that uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit will allow the open class to be used of God uh, to bring stability and encouragement to our church. You say, that sounds a big uh, egocentric. Well, let me tell you, I asked Brother Lewis this morning what the average is here on a Sunday morning, and it's about 120, 150, around there. Uh, we have 300 on the roll. How many can tell me were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost? 120. And they turned the world upside down. But they did it under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that Brother Dan feels in his heart that the open class can be a catalyst in our church, can be a blessing to this church. And I believe it also. Can we say amen to that? And I believe that our teaching team is committed to uphold Dan's teaching agenda with a consistency 
in message, and that's what we're going to be doing. Our class as a whole must be committed to supporting the class as we always do, but most especially with our spiritual support. I, I, I begin the class with this because this was an intended purpose. We had a, a meeting not too long ago of our uh, team with Dan, and, and uh, we're all getting on the same page and I'm happy to see that not only us, but also the church. And I think this is by divine design that God is putting the church in the same uh, frame of mind so that we can prepare ourselves to receive a new pastor. Well, I've been prayerfully considering a relevant topic for this morning. Dan and I had agreed uh, on a topic of the place of prayer uh, for a church in transition. I shall begin by touching on that, uh, but I've given prayerful consideration to, to the morning's lesson, and I shall major on the topic of faith, obedience, and love. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I, I am rather private. I don't share a lot of my aches and pains with uh, a lot of people, but I have this morning with one or two of the folks that I love and appreciate but I got to tell you, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I always park on this side of the building. And I know that Brother Jerry Ingram always parks on this side of the building. This morning, when I was um, in my van getting ready to get out of the van, I was almost praying that God would give me strength to do that because I don't feel so hot. But you know, all of a sudden, I don't know why, again, by divine design, Jerry Ingram decides to park on this side. And when I saw his van pull up, all of a sudden, my body felt like those dancers, you know, when they do like this and it goes the other side, and, and my legs started doing the same thing, and I felt like I could really motivate again. That's what Jerry Ingram does for me. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> I appreciate him so much. But then if that wasn't enough, as I was coming down that little walkway, I came in the building and I went and uh, got myself uh, ready to come in this room. And lo and behold, I come in the room and my brother, Lewis, is here getting his stuff ready. Well, you know, Lewis being the man of God he is, he prayed for me and I got to tell you, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, a class or two ago, you may remember this. <clears throat> Dan concluded our lesson by stating that we need to practice living the presence of God. How many remember him saying that? Yeah. It was right at the end of the class, maybe two or three weeks ago. One very crucial way that we as believers must practice the presence of God is in our prayer life. And I'm beginning with this because if anything else happens for the glory of God, it has to begin with our awareness of the presence of God in and through us and in our prayer life, our personal, private prayer lives. A child of God, I must say, a child of God that does not experience a personal prayer life cannot know victorious living. I don't care how well one speaks. I don't care how well one is in attitude. I don't care how charismatic you are. A person that has not discovered the beauty of a, an intimate prayer life just cannot experience victorious living. I'm sure that if I go around the room here, I'll find case after case of individuals who have found themselves in very difficult situations, whether in time of war, whether in time of peace, whether illness, and you've come to that place where you can almost see death staring you in the face. Well, you know, for the believer, that's not such a bad thing. But we have things that we want to leave behind that are in order, etc., and we just don't feel like we need to leave our children and our families right away. So we find ourselves really asking God for that special touch. I know I've been there. 
There's one thing I'd like to talk about briefly. I believe one of the mistakes that we make as believers is we find ourselves readily communicating with God. This morning, many of you got up and you spoke to the Lord. When you go to bed at night, you speak to the Lord. Many of you find yourselves being asked to pray for other people. These are things that we do. But how many of us take the time, instead of us communicating with God, take the time to let God communicate with us? One way we could name that would be maybe meditation, meditating. He said, be still and know that I am the Lord thy God. You know, I did a little, uh, a little study on that uh, verse, be still. And I always thought it was, it was a word of encouragement. You know, don't worry, I've, I've, I've got this. I've got this. I love you, you're my child. Like Dan always tells us, he likes to have us on his lap. And, but you know what? That verse in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 41, does not, if you look at it in context, it's not talking about uh, lovely encouragement. That's in the middle of a very difficult situation. It's in the middle of a situation that, that uh, was almost impossible. And the advice to the psalmist was, be still and know that I am God. In other words, no matter what situation you're in, I'm still God. I'm God on that floor out there. I'm God on this platform. I'm God in Kansas City, and I'm God, I'm, I'm God wherever Dan is. Be still, he says, and know that I am God. And if we take that advice and we just be still, then something miraculous happens. He begins to speak to us. Have you ever heard that term, the, the silent whisper of the Holy Spirit? You know, he doesn't always yell at us. And we sit there and we listen. Oh, I've been there. And I hope you have too. We as believers must grow in our prayer life to where we can enjoy being very much aware of the presence of God within us. How many have had somebody come behind you or alongside you that, you know, maybe you can't see them, but they have really gotten into your space, as they say. And you can almost feel like they're there. Have you ever experienced that? Oh, I have. I have. You know, you, you can tell somebody's there. You turn around, there they are. Let me tell you a little story that I, I, I think I was being clever once. I was teaching for uh, several years. I was teaching a bilingual Spanish class in Olathe. And um, one day I, I was trying to make the concept of awareness of the presence of God real to this class. And uh, it was truly a bilingual class because I had those that didn't speak English and I had one or two that, uh, you know, that, that um, spoke Spanish, but they were of the church. Well, I thought it would be a bright idea if I invited a gentleman I knew from our church there that was a police officer. And I said, you know, would you do me a favor next week when I begin the class? I'm not going to recognize you. I'm not going to acknowledge you or anything like that. But you just come in when I start the class and I'm already rolling. You come in in your uniform and just do me a favor and stand off the side and just stand there. And I uh, noticed when he came in and I just uh, kept on teaching and I was teaching bilingual. I would teach you know, one sentence in English, one in Spanish, back and forth, back and forth. And he just came in and very casually stood there with his hands behind him and then his hands in front, and he would look at his uniform and make sure he was okay. And during that entire class, I started to notice that nobody was paying attention to me. They wouldn't even, they weren't even realizing what I was talking about. And then it hit me. They were, they were very much aware of this police officer being there because 90, 95% of the class were illegal aliens. I didn't think of that. 
You know, I could have used something else, like a guy in a white robe, like an angel or something. It just didn't occur to me. But I'll tell you what, when I, you know, when I finally introduced him and they knew what I was trying to do, there was a sigh of relief. But I guarantee you they got the message of what it means to be aware of someone being in your presence. I believe that we as believers in our prayer life, uh, we need to be in the point where we can enjoy the presence of God within us. Daring to do so, I believe, will have a dramatic effect on our lives and will have an impact on our service to and our ministry for the Lord. When Paul said pray without ceasing, we all know what he meant by that. He didn't mean walk around with a somber look in your hands folded. He meant walk around being continuously aware of the presence of God in your life. I mean, just think about it. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, and like the little children's song says, he's big enough to rule the universe, but he's small enough to live within our hearts. That's who God is. And if we live with that consciousness, then I believe it's totally possible to pray without ceasing. The Holy Spirit at our new birth will find a, with, with, with a realization of the Holy Spirit now living within us, we will find ourselves being transformed over time. Uh, I belong to a, a men's accountability group there at uh, the church in Olathe. It was College Church of the Nazarene, in case you're interested. And Saturday mornings, we would meet at 6 a.m. for coffee. And we, we had a very interesting group. We had a, uh, a gentleman that was, uh, this was so many years ago, I'm sure they're all gone. So one was a doctor. One was a Navy uh, lieutenant commander. One was a real estate broker. Uh, myself, I was in business and also did church work there uh, with the Hispanic ministry. And then there was another one that was, uh, uh, had a PhD in civil engineering, which today is on a presidential commission doing work for energy conservation, et cetera. I, I see him on, on uh, iTunes, or not iTunes. What is that other one? The, huh? No. Uh, Anyway, I see him there. We were, we were in our Saturday morning group enjoying coffee and just sharing, you know, the week, how things went during the week. And, you know, the purpose of these accountability groups is uh, it's kind of like Vegas. What happens there stays there. There is no sharing with anybody. You have the, the freedom of calling your accountability brother any time of the day or night if you're having a problem. And uh, one of our men said, you know, I'm going to confess to the group that I have a problem with pornography. And I've tried really hard, and, and I, I know that God doesn't want me to be involved in this, but I have a problem. I mean, I'm just telling you, I do. So what can I do? There is a gal in the office that just makes it so difficult for me to, I mean, she really challenges my sanctification, he would say. I said, you know, how about this? How about every time that the devil presents this to you, you say, not lust, but love like Jesus did. When you see something like that, say, not lust, but love like Jesus did. Become increasingly aware of who it is that's living within you. Next week, tell us how that goes. And then everybody in the class the following week practiced that, me included. And he said, you know what, Ben? It's crazy. But every time the opportunity came, that's what I said. Not lust, but love like Jesus would. See this person the way Jesus would. And by the end of the week, I wasn't even needing to do it. I mean, it was just happening. And that's what the Bible talks about when it says that we, when, when we are aware of who it is that is living within us, then the Holy Spirit of God 
uh, where is it, Romans, where it says, uh, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You remember the saying that, uh, I think it was Mrs. Which presidential wife was it that said, just do it? Nancy Reagan? Remember that just do it slogan? Just do it? Yeah, it became a Nike slogan, but that's another story. Huh? Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, there, was, there was one, uh, yeah, Nike was just do it. Just say no, right? It's what she said, yeah. Just say no. Well, here's how I feel. I believe that when Paul said, work out your own salvation, he was saying, you know, you got to take part in this. We don't work for our salvation. But after we are saved, we do take part in making sure that we stay on the straight and narrow. That's what the Holy Spirit is there for, to help to guide us, to help to teach us, to help to, to strengthen us. But then it says, then it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as we renew our minds and we're saying, no, I'm going to do it the way Jesus would have me do it, then God is the one that does the transforming. And before you know it, you find yourself doing things and saying things that you couldn't believe that you could do before, but it's because of the Holy Spirit living within us. Renew your minds, and God will do the transforming. Okay? This is the difference between man-made organizations that try to help us to reform. God doesn't reform us. He transforms us. The Bible says that we become new creatures. We become new people in and out. Well, another damn Hurst ism for us. <clears throat> God will transform us more and more into the image of his son, imparting his, wins, uh, his wisdom and his power to us for his glory. That's his plan for his children. I was amazed this morning. Before I get to the church here, since I drive from Olathe, I take in two real good Bible studies and two good sermons. And this morning, uh, Dr. Tony Evans preached uh, an exciting message about this very same thing. And then I listened to, there at the end of my little trip, I listened to the Lutheran Hour. And they have a new young man uh, there uh, as the preacher for the Lutheran Hour that I'm quite impressed with. And he was preaching this morning on the same topic of prayer. So I felt reaffirmed by God that I was talking on the right thing because everything I was listening to pertained to this. But when we become aware of his presence and we become uh, in a situation where we're doing things the way we believe he would have us to do them in our prayer life, we must always believe that it must be for his glory. I believe it was the last class that we had with Dan that he said, in God's plan, God always gets the glory. Remember him saying that? But God's people, say it with me, always get the victory. There are a few things more, there are a few things more beautiful to me in the church. I'm, I am a real fan of the church of Jesus Christ. Then seeing believers opening up their hearts to God and opening up their hearts to the Holy Spirit and become increasingly aware of his presence within them. The believer who has determined to trust in Jesus and has the object of their faith, the finished work of Calvary, is positioned and equipped to enjoy the presence of the Lord in their prayer life. That's the only way that it can happen. We have many objects of our faith. For many people, it's coming to church. For many people, the object of their faith is doing something for in a, in a benevolent way. For some people, it's singing in the choir. For some people, it's just church attendance. But I gotta tell you, all of the good things we can do won't save us at all. Our salvation comes in one way and one way only. 
by putting our faith and our trust, focusing on the finished work of Calvary. When my mother was failing in, in health, I was concerned about her, her mental state, and I would call her every day. She was in Puerto Rico, and I, I would ask her questions, and she would kind of play me along, you know, and, and, and I would say, Mom, uh, tell me something, Mom. If, if the Lord calls you home right now, and you're at the gates, and they're asking you, Lydia, why should we let you in here? What would you tell them? Oh, and she would get me good. She would say, well, you know, I would tell them that for many, many years I was the church secretary, and I would tell them that for many, many years I was in the church choir, that I taught the young kids in Sunday school, and she knew that I was over here cringing. And then I could hear her begin to giggle a little bit, and I'd say, Mom, you're pulling my leg, aren't you? And she would say, do you think I'm losing my mind? I know exactly what I would say. I would tell them it's because of the blood of Calvary that I can get in there. Let me in. <laughs> so that's the only way we can get in. The only way. So to kind of close this little portion on prayer and, and spend the next few minutes on, on uh, another topic here. Brother Dan and uh, Brother Lewis and I, Brother Don, was busy doing what he does uh, on that particular day with, with the uh, uh, rescue mission. We started talking about how we wanted the open class. I mean, I got to tell you, Dan has a vision. Dan has a heart. And we agreed that we, as a, an open class, could be used of God to encourage the church. But in order to do that, we had to really major on focusing on the presence of God in our lives individually, in our class as a whole, in our prayer life. So one of the things that we're going to be doing, at least for the transition period, and I hope will continue, is when we come in in the morning, right after the service, and we start to fellowship, if you want to call it that, and we start talking about this, that, and the other, and getting our coffee, nothing wrong with that. That is all very good. Well, but during this transition time, I think what we're going to want to do is we're going to come in, and we're going to get our coffee as quickly as possible, and before he starts the lesson, we're going to practice the presence of God in our lives. I am not exaggerating when I say that my heart breaks when I hear someone in the class say, I could have died and nobody even called me. I'm sick, I don't feel well, I wish someone would pray for me. You know, we have a large class. And we cannot, it's impossible to be able to know all of the circumstances in the class. That's why we started this signing in thing, so we can keep track of people. But I think, I think we, we can take at least a few minutes in the morning before we start the class. And just like I did today, do we have any prayer requests? And if we have people that know we're going to do that, they will come ready to present their request before the Lord. Now, we're not talking about trivial matters, although, like I said in our, in our little luncheon, everybody's problem is the biggest problem in the world to them, no matter how trivial it may look to us. But what we want to do is, since our time is going to be so limited, we really want to pray about things that can challenge God in our midst. We want to pray about things that can challenge us to recognize God's presence in our lives. We just don't want to do things that we know are going to happen anyway so we can feel good about it. We want to learn the presence of God in our lives, in our class. Are you all in for that? I think it'll be a great time. It'll be a great time. And maybe after the transition, it, it, it may just develop into something that will be just a, a, a dynamic part of our, of our class. Well, <coughs> I 
<clears throat> back in 73, 74, around there. While I was stationed in Fortuna, North Dakota, we had some students on a missions trip uh, that came to spend a week with our little mission church. We had a little mission church that had maybe about um, 30, and all from the air base. It was a little radar site there. Uh, the town of Fortuna, and I've told you about this town before, the sign on the road as you come in says population 100, but that's when the farmers come to town, you know? Otherwise, it's just maybe 20, 30 people in town. Interestingly enough, though, it had one main street, one bar, one laundromat, one town hall, uh, one motel, one gas station, and five churches. Five churches. Interesting. Well, during that week, uh, this young group of uh, missionaries came uh, in for uh, a mission trip uh, to be with us for that week, and they put on a musical for us from the Ralph Carmichael album, Tell It Like It Is. Who, who can remember that, that album? It was very, very popular back in the 70s. You remember that? One of the songs on that album is Love is Surrender. To me, the words to that song were simple, yet so profound. They were so profound that back, what, the 70s, the early 70s, to this day, I can see that group of young people standing before us singing, and the words to that song burn deep in my heart. I was going to play a couple songs for us, but I decided not to because uh, as you know, I work in funeral homes, and in the funeral homes, when I do a, a when I officiate a service, music is a big part of the services that I do. I, I play songs, you know, I meet with the family, I see what songs they would like, what hymns, some of them want songs that are, you know, that are secular, but music is a big part of the celebration of life service. We don't mourn the death, we celebrate the life. Uh, but every funeral home that I work in, if you go back to the control room where we play the music and all, there's a license on the wall that allows us to play songs, uh, you know, that are out in public. This way we can't get sued. That made me think about Dan, you know, when he sings that crazy happy birthday song, and he says that he, that he does it all crazy like that because, you know, he doesn't want to get sued by the copyright people. I think he may be, you know, more the, because that's his business, you know. He knows what he's talking about. So I just decided maybe I shouldn't play any songs that I had recorded. So I am, though, going to read some of the lyrics to you. The song, Love is Surrender to His Will by Ralph Carmichael. By the way, the Carpenters, you remember them? They, they also sang it, but I, I listened to their version and instead of saying uh, his will, they uh, changed it to something else. It says, talk about love, how it makes life complete. You can talk all you want, make it sound nice and sweet. But the words have an empty ring, and they don't really mean a thing. Without him, love is not to be found, not to be found. For love is surrender. Love is surrender to his will. Love is surrender to his will. I'm not going to take time to read the other verses, but you get the idea. Love is surrender to his will. So we can see that faith and obedience by what we have read here. Faith and obedience are joined at the hip, so to speak. A Dan Hurstism is faith, and you all know this one, say it with me. Faith is trusting obedience to the known will of God. If Dan is watching on Facebook, he's happy right now, listen in. <laughs> However, it must be a faith, as I said before, it must be a faith in the correct object for God to recognize it. And that correct object of our faith can only be the finished work of Calvary. 
can only be. We can have faith in so many things. As I was driving in and I heard the gentleman from the Lutheran Hour quote some statistics, I was amazed. And they were reliable. He said that in this poll they took, about 30% of atheists that were in this poll admitted that they pray. 17% admitted that they pray regularly. Now, having been in combat, as Jerry has, I can tell you, it is true there aren't too, you know, very many atheists in a foxhole. But I started wondering about how many different ways are there to pray? How many people have seen folks maybe at the mall sitting down watching people and they have a little thing of beads and they're rolling the beads one by one. Every time they pass a bead, it's a different prayer that they're saying. Uh, Islam, uh, the, you know, the Muslims, uh, the Roman Catholics with the rosary. There are so many different ways that people pray that don't get past the ceiling. But we as believers in Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you, have a different way of praying. Because we are praying because we have the person of the living God living within us. And even if we're not ver you know, verbally saying words and we're thinking words, he hears them. And he's listening to us. By the same token, if we're thinking and saying things that he doesn't like, the Bible says that he's grieved by that. So we must always remember that. So, however, it must be that type of faith that we trust, that we trust. I wish I had time to go over that little, little story again that I told once about uh, in that same class with the cop, you know. Again, I was trying to get the message of the word trust across. And I had one young man in particular that kept arguing with me that in Spanish there was no such word. And I kept telling him that there was, you know, that the concept and the word existed. And everybody in the class knew that I flew airplanes. And, and you all remember the story I told you, how I put two chairs in front of the class and I made him sit next to me and I told him we were, we were going to, to uh, uh, fly somewheres. And then we got to the point where I convinced him that the airplane was going down and he had a parachute on. And uh, we went on and on and on. And finally, he got to the point where he pushed the little door open, imaginary, and fell out of his chair like he trusted in the parachute. And then I asked the class, the, you know, yes or no, did he have a parachute on? Yes. Did he believe it? Yes. But as long as he believed it and stayed in the airplane, did that parachute help him? No. So what happened to save him? He trusted the parachute by jumping out. And that's how we are as Christians. We can believe all we want to. We can believe all we want to. But unless we come to the point that we trust, that we trust, taking that step of trust is not until then that we'll start seeing things happen. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are being saved... It is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, I, I have to confess, I'm still old school, and I love show and tell, and I love uh, all kinds of different things that uh, we can do on the platform. But I believe that to see a real move of the Holy Spirit, you have to get back to that old style of preaching the Word of God. That's what the Bible tells us. It's through the preaching of the Word that God has chosen to reach the hearts of men. I believe that. I've seen it. Uh, 
Okay, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. For I determine to know nothing among you, said Paul, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Faith on anything or anyone else is a faith that God, unfortunately, will not honor. John MacArthur says in his commentary, Obedience is a hallmark of genuine saving faith and love for God. Those who are truly saved by grace alone will invariably respond with a life of submission and service. Jesus connects his own obedience, his own obedience to his love for the Father. John 14, 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. We should not be surprised when Jesus continuously connects the ideas of love and obedience. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a promise that is. What a promise that is. You can walk around. I don't know if you've ever been as crazy as I, but I've walked around uh, my house, and, I, and I'll look in a room, and I'll talk to the Lord there, you know, and I'll talk to him about something I see, or I just, because folks, I really believe he's with me. How about you? I really believe that he's living within me. I really believe that wherever I am, he is there also. That's what he's saying here. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, he said, but the Father's, the Father who sent me. John 15, 10, 14. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You remember John 10.10, 10. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and have it in abundance. I tell my kids all the time, nobody wants to see you happier than Jesus does, but you got to do things his way. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's to us. What did he say? If, if the world is going to know that you're my children, they're going to know it by seeing the love that you have one to another. That's what he says. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? I mean, how did he love us? How many of us would be willing to give our lives right now for somebody in this room? Let's say not somebody that's in your table you know really well. Let's say somebody on the other side of the room that maybe you've never even met. Remember the joke? I'm sure that you've heard it. It's been told from every pulpit in the world. Back when, when uh, Russia was really active and, and uh, the Christians were being persecuted, 
two or three Russian soldiers came in with machine guns and they locked all the doors to the church and said, okay, those of you that want to renounce your Christian faith, now is your time. You got three minutes, otherwise you die. Well, the pews started emptying out. People started piling out of that church left and right. When everybody stopped leaving, that was going to stop or, you know, that was going to leave. They went back and locked all the doors, put their machine guns down and said, good, now we can have some good Christian fellowship. <laughs> God has told us to love one another as he has loved us. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jerry, we hear that a lot, don't we, when, when we do Jerry? Jerry Ingram. We hear that verse a lot when we're at cemeteries, out with the military, right? No greater love, uh, see, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. The Apostle John, who records these words of Jesus, reinforces these things in his epistles. 1 John three, uh, 2, 3 to 5. Now by this we know, this is one that I really didn't want to read because it's kind of tough, but you know, I didn't write it. I'm just the messenger. Now by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You know, whenever I hear in my mind that verse that says, that if, if, if I don't love someone the way that the Lord loves me, I think about that. And if the love, and if I don't really love that person, then plainly the love of God is not in me. And that scares me. But whoever keeps God's word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. Whenever I do a service at a gravesite, especially, uh, some, some families don't want anything religious. And I always pray and I ask for ways that God can help me say something that at least may stay in their minds. You know, the Holy Spirit may bring it back at another time. And when I, when I do the part, you know, that you've all heard about dust to dust, ashes to ashes and all that. And, I, and then I talk about uh, when he returns uh, for those that are in him. I always emphasize that. And that's all I say. I don't make an issue of it. I just talk about them that are in him. And I have had people come and say, what did you mean by in him? And I have an opportunity then to express. Let's see. By this we know, 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So, with all of these scripture passages that we've read, and I took time to read them, we've demonstrated through the scriptures what the only real evidence of our love for God must be. A salvation that hinges on a mere profession of faith just may not be sufficient proof that one truly loves God. Our salvation experience is not just an emotional response, but a supernatural response from God when we exhibit our faith through grace. I'm sorry to say that I see so many people come forward. And while many are rejoicing and clapping, and uh, there's reason for that. But as one that has pastored 
as one that has done missionary work. My heart breaks when I see that because I know what the possibilities are that that person is going to come back from shaking those hands and then two, three days, weeks, months down the road, those folks won't even know their name. And we're going to have to answer for that. If there was one thing that Brandon Park did in that discipleship training he did was, was open our eyes to the fact that it is possible to talk to the Lord about, I mean, to talk to the world about. I got to tell you, I love the Lord so much, and this is not bragging. This is the truth. I think it was Johnny Carson that said that if you can do it, you're not bragging. I love the Lord so much that it doesn't bother me. It, it, it doesn't even enter my mind that when I meet someone in a restaurant or someone that I feel doesn't look loving, I don't even think twice about going to them and talking to them about the Lord. Now, you don't do this helter-skelter, you know, willy-nilly. You have to depend on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But folks, I got to tell you, if we don't do it, who is? Who is? For well, by grace, you have been saved through faith, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. As I close, our faith then <clears throat> must be one that instills in us <clears throat> a love that leads us. And, and if you didn't hear anything else, please hear this. Our love then must be one that instills in us a love that leads us to do his will, to love each other, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily, and to follow him through the good or bad circumstances of life. That is the love that the unbeliever will see in you and me as believers. And that is the love that the Holy Spirit will use to draw that believer to surrender at the foot of the cross. The Bible says that no man comes to the Father unless he is drawn of the Spirit. True? How can they be drawn of the Spirit if they don't know that there is even such a thing? They must see it in us. I wish I could have finished by closing with this song, but since I can't play it, with the closing two minutes, I want to read at least one or two of the uh, stanzas and the chorus. I'm a Southern gospel guy. I'm, I'm not really big on, on you know, the new millennial sound and all, although I come from a musical family. I come from a family that loves music, and I can listen to anything. And I've kind of, you know, listened more and more to 88.5 and all that because there isn't much more to listen to, actually. But uh, I heard this group, Casting Crowns, sing this song. And when they sang this song, I had to go buy it. I bought the CD because the message is so incredible. Just listen to this as we close. I, I know you know the song, and I know you've probably heard it a hundred times, but here's what it says. It's crowded in worship today as the slips, as she slips in, trying to fade into the faces. The girl's teasing laughter is carrying farther than they know. Farther than they know. Second stanza. A traveler is far away from home. He sheds his coat and quietly sinks into the back row. The weight of their judgmental glances tells him that his chances are better out on the road. The chorus. But if we are the body, if we are the body, we the church, if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his? Why aren't his hands healing? 
why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who should come. And we are the body of Christ. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them that there is a way? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his body. Jesus is the way. And it's my prayer that as we focus on the presence of God in our lives, in our prayer life, in our life as a class, that God will use us as a catalyst to help this, our church, his church, to continue to grow in the spirit even as we are waiting on his man that he already knows who it is that's coming. Can we say amen? amen? Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you. We praise you for who you are, <clears throat> for what you mean to us. Thank you, Father, <clears throat> for giving me the strength to be able to carry out this class. Thank you, Father, for your truth that you love us. You love us so much that you came to identify with your creation. And not only that, but after you gave yourself as a ransom, you came and in the person of your spirit indwell each and every one of us who claim the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all that you're going to do. I'm thanking you in advance for the wonderful things that will be coming in and through this class, in and through this church, in this community, in this city. Pray traveling mercies, Father, for Brother Dan and Marcia as they travel back from visiting Mom and the family. And those of us here, Lord, I don't know all the requests, but you do. Pray that you would make us all aware of your presence as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.